arise for the limited purpose of introducing a very distinguished colleague. And I guess it takes a judge to introduce another judge. <laughs> it is indeed my very special privilege to introduce Dr. Navi Pillay. Dr. Navi Pillay is, as we all know, a South African and a great South African, qualified the ALLB at the University of Natal, and subsequently moved on to study an LLM and a doctorate in law from Harvard Law School in the USA. And after many, many years of activism in South Africa and very active participation in our struggle for emancipation against apartheid and colonialism, she was elevated ultimately to become the judge president of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And subsequent there too, she moved on to become judge of appeal of <clears throat> appeals division of the International Criminal Court. And beyond that, her present and perhaps highest accolade came when Dr. Navi Pile was appointed to become the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. And that election was done by the General Assembly, and might I add, on a unanimous basis. And Dr. Pile has been re-elected for a second term, and is the first And she is the first person ever to be given a second term in this particular post. A very exceptional South African, a great lawyer, great freedom fighter, and indeed a great leader on the global scale. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Navi Pillay. Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu, distinguished psychologists, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. I'm very pleased to participate at the opening of the 30th International Congress of Psychology. The focus of this event provides a good opportunity for explore, exploring the nexus of psychology and human rights and how they serve humanity. For many years, human rights and psychology have been considered as two distinct spheres, without any points of intersection and without any consideration of complementary approaches and cross-sectional studies. What has been omitted is the fact that they do have a common objective. Both of them promote and protect people's well-being. I see at least four ways in which health, including psychological well-being and human rights, correlate. The first one is that the failure to protect human rights can have adverse consequences for health. Very few people would deny that psychological trauma that results from domestic violence or sexual exploitation of children, uh, or poverty, for instance, <coughs> is not harmful. Secondly, activities in the field of mental health may themselves violate human rights. In many countries, mentally ill people may be involuntarily hospitalized on the basis of procedures that do not fully respect their right to personal liberty and security. The relation between health and human rights can be a mutually reinforcing one. My third point is that activities in the field of mental health may serve to promote the enjoyment of human rights. Take, for instance, the right of victims of human rights violations to reparations that include rehabilitation. <coughs> and fourthly, the protection of human rights may enhance psychological well-being. In this brief statement, allow me to elaborate on these points. What I would begin by calling the framework, the very specific specificity of the concept 
of human rights is that they belong to the individual in his or her quality as a human being who cannot be deprived of their substance in any circumstances. These rights are thus intrinsic to the human condition. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights gives expression to this fundamental ethical basis in its first preambular paragraph by recognizing, I quote, the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. There is no widely accepted definition of human well-being. It is usually considered as a multifactorial concept that is based on the satisfaction of various physical and psychological needs. Already in 1946, the preamble of the Constitution of the World Health Organization described health, I quote, as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, and underlined that the employment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, or social condition. This approach reveals the complex nature of health and also emphasizes the importance of the principles of equality and non-discrimination, which are fundamental in human rights law. In recent decades, international human rights law has had ever-growing impact on domestic legal systems throughout the world. Under international human rights law, states are responsible and accountable for issues related to mental health. This is clearly expressed in Article 12 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which recognizes the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Since then, other international human rights treaties have recognized or referred to the right to health or to elements of it. Now, on the need to pay attention to victims, developments around the world over the past decades have demonstrated that establishing effective mechanisms to ensure that perpetrators of human rights violations will not go unpunished is an important step in restoring the rule of law in the aftermath of conflict or authoritarian regimes. National accountability mechanisms are also vital to ensuring that victims obtain appropriate remedies and redress. International law prohibits arbitrary detention and recognizes the severe consequences it has on physical and mental health. Even in cases of legal detention, there are standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners that have to be applied to minimize psychological harm, including access to fresh air, adequate food, drinking water, medical services, family and lawyer's visits. The psychological consequences for victims of blatant human rights violations such as those arising from torture, are obvious. In this regard, international law defines torture as any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person. States' parties are called upon to undertake measures to address the psychological consequences of victims of torture and to ensure that such victims have access to psychological counseling and rehabilitation. You know better than anybody else that psychological damage inflicted by serious human rights violations such as torture continues long after the physical wounds have healed. Evidence suggests that even in the presence of extreme physical pain, psychological torture is the most severe traumatic experience as it threatens to destroy an individual's sense of self, 
In this regard, effective and prompt redress, <coughs> compensation, and appropriate social, psychological, medical, and other forms of rehabilitation for victims may enhance the healing process by supporting the victim's sense of justice. In this context, I would like to point out that the provision of reparations for victims is as important as the punishment of perpetrators. My office, both at headquarters in Geneva and at country level, has implemented various activities focusing on reparation of victims, particularly in the area of transitional justice, rooted in the rights to justice, to true reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence, transitional justice mechanisms constitute a comprehensive approach for combating impunity, ensuring accountability for past human rights violations, redress for victims of violations of human rights, and advancing broader institutional reform necessary to address the root causes of strife and conflict. While the need for psychological support to victims of human rights violations, also taking into consideration the fact that some of them are victims of multiple forms of discrimination, has been recognized by several human rights bodies, these efforts are far from sufficient. More attention should be paid to the inextricable links between psychology and human rights already in the realm of prevention. It is the time to be proactive and not reactive. It is the time to anticipate, plan and form partnerships that will serve humanity and contribute substantially <coughs> to the well-being of people. My office has two special funds that support the victims of torture and contemporary forms of slavery. The United Nations Fund for Victims of Torture has provided financial assistance to more than 600 organizations and entities worldwide, including four projects in South Africa, which in turn have enabled hundreds of thousands of victims to deal with the devastating psychological and physical consequences of torture and overcome the trauma they have endured. Additionally, the United Nations Voluntary Trust Fund on Contemporary Forms of Slavery has provided support to more than 400 projects which have directly assisted thousands of victims of contemporary forms of slavery in all regions of the world. May, not, may I now address a few remarks on racism and xenophobia? These are old and yet new ills.